This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. We welcome now our very special contributor here on Wall Street Week. He is Larry Summers of Harvard. Larry, thank you so much for being with us here in New York. It has been quite a week uh, where we lost Charlie Munger, we lost, uh, uh, we lost uh, Henry Kissinger, and then on Friday we actually lost Sandra Day O'Connor as well. I know you knew Henry well, you knew Charlie Munger. Talk about uh, Henry Kissinger and your experience. He was an extraordinary man. It was extraordinary to see somebody in their 80s and then in their 90s and then 100 years old, so incredibly intellectually vital, looking to learn about uh, AI, speaking to most of the world's leading statesmen every uh, several months. He was fully engaged and active in the way that many people half his age uh, wouldn't have had the energy and uh, the drive to do. He was somebody who always thought in the large first, understanding the broad historical forces that were shaping relationships between countries, from that forming a conception of strategy, from that conception of strategy working uh, to uh, tactics. It was anything but the day-to-day -day political thrust of statements that so often seems to preoccupy uh, leaders these days. He surely didn't get everything right, but he certainly was always trying to reason from the large uh, to reason down. And I learned from his deeply, in a way, tragic uh, sensibility. Um, he was the idealist as realist. Hmm. He and the, real, and the realist as idealist. Henry, maybe because of how and where he grew up, uh, in Germany in the 1930s, feared disorder, feared chaos, feared the complete triumph of passion over reason. And his determination was to bring about stability, not because he somehow thought that the pride of nations and strength was what was most important, but because when there was the containment of evil. That was when people had an opportunity to live and uh, flourish. And those were powerful, uh, pow powerful ideas. He was, a, he was a figure who was also very generous to people who he had no compelling reason uh, to uh, be generous uh, too. He was as impressive and extraordinary a person as I've known. He was also in many ways as complex a person as uh, I have uh, known. Yeah, I must say, I was one of the beneficiaries of that because for reasons that are unknown to me, he sort of adopted me a little bit when I came to New York and invited me to various events where we learned about, about the economic world and the world of geopolitics where I otherwise wouldn't have. Charlie Munger, uh, the partner of Warren Buffett, important. How, what effect did he have on investing uh, writ large? You know, I think the first thing to say is that Charlie and Henry had something very important in common. They had different interests, they had different uh, styles, they had different ways of speaking. But they both had a deep commitment to seeing the world as it was, hmm. not as they wanted it to be. And they began by trying to see things as realistically as clinically accurately as possible, and that was the basis for decision, whether it was political and diplomatic decision in Henry's case, whether it was financial and investment decision in Charlie's uh, case. What I got from both of them was this commitment to detached observation as a prelude to uh, taking uh, action. You know, by um, Warren's testimony, uh, Charlie provided a really extraordinary insight. Um, he said, and it's 
different than the old-fashioned and traditional value investing credo. Charlie rejected the idea of buying uh, fair companies at great prices. He thought you'd ultimately do better buying great companies at fair prices. And that philosophy of finding the best, making sure you weren't overpaying, and then sticking with it is one that has certainly served, certainly served him and certainly served uh, Warren uh, well. But I saw it, Charlie was an, alum, was an involved alum of Harvard Law School while I was uh, the president yeah. of Harvard. And he had a view, yeah. it was clear, there was a logic, he was prepared yeah. to argue yeah. and uh, defend it. Uh, he too was an extraordinary uh, figure. And right. you have to also look at both Henry and Charlie and see the power of staying curious. Yeah. They stayed yeah. with it to the very end and yeah. I think their curiosity, their love of reading, their love of right. discussion, their love of yeah. argument was part of what caused them to flourish for so very long. Well, it may be a reach, but I think you're uh, really emulating that uh, in staying curious as you've now taken I've, this role with OpenAI. You talk about Henry Kissinger with OpenAI, you're taking it on. Let me ask you, frankly, why did you take the job and what do you hope to do with it? I thought that, as I said on your show, that this was something that was extraordinarily important. You know, no one can be certain whether this is a once a decade technology, a once a half century technology, a once a century technology, a once a millennium uh, technology. No one can know that for sure, but it sure looks like it's awfully important to develop rapidly and safely and to disseminate effectively and well. So when I was offered an opportunity to be part of contributing to that and overseeing to make sure that that was um, effectively done and to do it working with some very great people, I thought it was a real opportunity and I was glad to do it. I don't want to take anything away from your technological expertise, but when in what you just said safely strikes me as probably part of what you're going to be focused on. And that gets to questions of governance, about how you handle this technology, wherever it's going and however powerful it may be. Do you have an overall sense of what you need to do to govern it to get the safely part right? You know, David, I've been on the job two days and <laughs> they're gonna send me the onboarding packet for uh, the board on Sunday. So I shouldn't be uh, saying too much uh, at all because I don't, I don't know enough. Here's some things I think I know. I think I know that a company like this has to be prepared to cooperate, doesn't mean always agree with, but cooperate with key government officials on regulatory issues, on national security uh, issues, on development of uh, technology uh, issues. I think I know also, and this is integral to the structure of uh, open AI, where the for-profit entity is itself a creature of a not-for-profit um, uh, entity that this needs to be a corporation with a conscience and that we need to be always thinking about the multiple stakeholders in the development of this technology. And as a board member, that will be part of my responsibility working with other uh, board members uh, to make uh, to make that uh, certain. You know, my colleague uh, at Harvard, late colleague, Ken Galbraith said that conscience is the knowledge that someone is watching. Hmm. And I think it's the responsibility for everybody involved in this to be thinking very carefully always hmm. about both opportunities and uncertainties and uh, to make sure that those are balanced in the best way uh, that's possible. 
It's fascinating. Well, I, I wish you luck as we all do, because as you've said on this program, it's a powerful, really powerful engine particularly, and could do an awful lot of good. At the same time, we have to be careful about it. Do you think it's still coming from the cognitive class? You said that once on this program. I think, yeah, I think one of the reasons, I think one thing that people should keep in mind as they read all the press about this is, this is a technology that does what reporters and journalists uh, do. Now you're hitting close so to home. I suspect <laughs> reporters and journalists That's may right. view it slightly differently than when yeah. it's technologies that are potentially affecting yeah. what some other people and do. And by the way, a few lawyers too, by the way. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm doubly vulnerable here. Absolutely. Larry, it's really great to have you with us, as it always is. That is our very special contributor, Larry Summers of Harvard. And this is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg.